Um, and welcome. It's so good to see so many of you. Um, so the title of today's webinar is Weaving a World uh, Where Many Worlds Fit, the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. Um, my name's Sheldon. I'm from Liverpool in the UK and I'm so pleased to be chairing this um, this webinar today. So as I'm sure you're all aware, the series has been organised in honour in, in conjunction with the Zapatista visit to Europe, the Europe from below. And we're going to be joined today by, sorry, I'm having confused the issues. Here we go. Um, by four core members of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives team, we have um, Anna Cecilia Dynastien, Trishti Badpai, Arturio Escobar, and Ashish Kathari, who will each be speaking for approximately 10 to 15 minutes each, followed by Q&A and then some final announcements at the very end. Okay, so um, the GTA, um, Global Tapestry of, of Alternatives, is an initiative seeking to create solidarity networks and strategic alliances on local, regional and global levels. As the world struggles to find ways out of multiple global crises, ecological, climate, um, health and social inequality, lots of alternative solutions and practices are emerging that are grounded in um, specific ecological and socio-economic contexts. Such alternatives are often based on diverse cosmologies and ethical principles that challenge the dominant capitalist heteropatriarchal systems um, we're all familiar with. So whilst attempting to sustain all life on Earth, these transformative alternatives are also innovating on a full range of human and non-human concerns, including food, water, health, education, livelihoods, governance, culture and justice. However, they're often isolated and there's a need to to build more bridges amongst them that enable cross-cultural and cross-mutual learning in critical engagement, as well as to enable a collective envisioning for possible futures leading to critical mass and okay, um, critical mass for macro change. So GTA aims to weave this transformative alternative through its non-hierarchical bottom-up process that, like I say, seeks to build strategic alliances between these global alternatives. And it's in this process of weaving that um, GTA locates itself in and helps to initiate these interactions. The GTA organizes itself through light, horizontal, democratic, inclusive, and non-centralized structures. As an ever-expanding complex set of tapestries woven together by already existing communal and collective webs, the GTA builds on um, pre-existing and new alternatives to dominant regimes and promotes global encounters, as well as having close and synergistic linkages with existing organizations such as um, the World Social Forum and Grassroots to Global Change. The GTA embraces the Zapatista Declaration for Life and welcomes their visit to Europe. The revolutionary struggle of the Zapatistas has been one of the sources of inspiration for GTA, its core members and endorsers, whilst honoring the Zapatistas' proposal to build a world where many worlds fit. In this webinar, the speakers will honor the Zapatista struggle um, by presenting the GTA's vision and ideas for radical change, which will be illustrated by real life experiences from various groups across different geographic locations. And um, by way of introduction to our speakers today, um, I'm delighted to introduce Anna Cecilia Dynastine, um, sorry, the window, who is originally from Argentina, but now UK based. Anna Cecilia teaches political sociology and critical decolonial and feminist theory at the University of Bath. She created the Global Politics of Hope, which is a post-disciplinary and intersectoral field for radical research and transformation. She's the author of The Politics of Autonomy in Latin America, The Art of Organizing Hope, published in 2015, and the editor of Social Sciences for Another Politics, Women Theorizing Without Parachutes, which was published in 2016. 
Secondly, I'd like to welcome Shristi Bajpai. Shristi is an activist researcher based in Pune, India, and a member of Kalpa Rish. Her research is focused on documenting, analyzing, and networking alternatives to development. Um, she helps in coordinating the Vikalp Sangam alternative complement process in India. Um, following Shristi, we'll have Arturo Escobar. Arturo is a Colombian activist researcher working on territorial struggles against extractivism, um, post-development regional transitions and ontological design. Um, Arturo taught anthropology and political ecology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill until 2018. And yeah, last but not least, we want to welcome Ashish Katari. Ashish is the founder member of Indian environmental group Kalpa Rish. He has co-authored slash co-edited over 30 books, including Pluriverse and Alternative Futures, and helps um, coordinate the Vikalp Sangam and Radical Ecological Democracy processes. Um, we are very, very happy to have you here today, and I'm looking forward to learning more about GTA initiative and the discussions that will follow. Um, and I guess I'm going to invite the speakers to begin their presentations, beginning with Anna Cecilia, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Zelda. Uh, well, I want to say thank you, and it is an honor to speak at this event. Uh, for the Zapatista Solidarity Network, and also to be here with my colleagues from the GTA. I want to say that our colleague uh, Vasna Ramasar, who is here in, in the audience, was unwell, but she, she's uh, attending anyway. So hi, Vasna. Hope you feel better soon. So indeed, we want to honor the Zapatistas, and I think this is a fascinating moment in radical politics because there has been a shift that has been happening for a while now uh, at grassroots movements, demonstrating that struggles against barbarism, uh, as we can call the combination of capitalism, patriarchy, and coloniality, is combined by the creation of spaces where we can breathe and organize social life alternatively. And this is uh, what I call the global politics of hope. And definitely the most important moment, uh, the most important date for this sea change in grassroots resistance has been the 1st of January, 94. Nothing is foundational, but it is clear that some events create important terms in the way we think and experience both power and our own resistance. And the poorest of the poor and the powerless people of the world, the indigenous peoples of Chiapas, Mexico, organized the Zapatistas movement and said no to the most powerful forces and the richest people in the world. And the struggle of course has become iconic and inspirational. And at the time, the Zapatistas declarations and communiques and documents portrayed hope as the opposite of globalization, as a rejection of conformity and defeat. Ya basta, enough is enough, means enough is enough to globalization, which according to them was a war against humanity. And of course the GTA, I believe, belongs to this new era. An era where the most vulnerable are not only saying no and demanding to the state, but they are creating the new worlds and bringing to play and prefiguring and anticipating other futures. So today, so many years after the uprising in 94, the Zapatistas have not only expanded their autonomous governments, good governments in Chiapas, but in a recent declaration for life, they invite, quote, those who share the same concerns and similar struggles, all honest people and all those below the rebels and resist, rebel and resist in the many corners of the world to join, contribute, support, and participate in these meetings and activities and sign and make this statement for life. And they come to Europe, to Spain, where everything started going wrong many, many years ago. I think this is extraordinary, but for me, this is not an act of defiance or surreal, as someone said, but an indicator of political maturity, 
of the Zapatistas movement. I think they are masters of denaturalizing or the denaturalization of capitalist, patriarchal, colonial society as our society, as the world we live in, the only viable model of collective human life, which normalizes violence, which is inherent in capitalist, colonial, patriarchal society. They are masters of pushing the boundaries and venturing beyond. They are masters of changing the question of utopia from an abstract plan created by the political party to a concrete utopia understood as praxis, understood as collective by subjects that are pluriversal, prefigurative, decolonial, ethical, ecological, communal, anti-patriarchal, anti-identitarian and democratic. They have problematized the idea of alternative, which in this case has to be also decolonized because the alternative brings back into a new life uh, many traditions, Mayan, Mayan traditions. <clears throat> but they have problematized rather than romanticized the, the idea of alternative because they have said no, but then they are proposing a critical affirmation of life where the no is maintained, but nevertheless, we are able to anticipate the present and the future. But they have also navigated many contradictions, not only the violence of the Mexican state, but internal problems and contradictions that happen in, in every organization. And they have been able to solve these contradictions into new ones, perhaps. And they have continued organizing hope, creating surplus possibilities. Some confuse the defense of life, which for me is a critical affirmation, with something that is humanistic or too utopian. And so I want to bring now some comments and statements from the Zapatista women who have gathered several times in Chiapas. In March, 2018, the Zapatistas' first international gathering of women who struggle in patriarchy welcome women of the world. I quote, Zapatistas compañeras, we invite you to commit to organize, to rise up and fight against capitalism and patriarchy. Not only to continue fighting the abuse and the evaluation of women, but also to blame for women's murders. So they invited women of all ages, races, and beliefs to meet, talk, and listen to women. I am using a resource of a, from a journalist um, who writes on human rights and Latin American politics, Heather Gies. He, he, she, um, she wrote about this gathering, so I'm quoting from, from there. A compañera, Erika, said at the time, we agreed to live and for us to live is to struggle. So we agree to each struggle in our own way, place and time. And Heather says her words were met with enthusiastic cheers and shouts of long lived Zapatistas women. They discuss feminism as well. And above all, they offer a critique of the problems, the constant problems that those who are here listening uh, if, if you are activists in a feminist movement will know the sectarianism and the fragmentation of the feminist movement from a perspective of the practicality of the practical uh, stance for feminism. They say there is a feminism that comes from experience. The lesson that Zapatistas compañeras give us, said someone present at the gathering, is not necessary to call yourself feminist, to have exceptional capacity to organize. And sometimes ideological fractures haven't allowed us to manage, to listen. And I think this is important because they try to fix this. And in this gathering, they have what they call the forest of women. And I quote, may that Di uh, diverse individual trees. Women at the conference enjoy live music, book, poetry, reading, theater performance and art displays, play social volleyball and basketball, etc. but talk about sexual diversity, health, safe abortion, indigenous rights, gender violence, and so on. 
And clearly, um, the example uh, of the women gathering to discuss all sorts of issues uh, is important, but there is something even more important that they have struggled within the organization, within the movement. And sometimes when we talk about the Zapatistas, we forget that gender issues and um, issues related to the women's rights were tough for the Zapatistas women. So there was a Zapatistas women's revolutionary law in early 90s to have the rights of political participation, health care, and freedom from violence. Of course, this has not been sorted out by a legislation, but it was important to have it. And as we know, they also uh, banned alcohol from the communities because they deemed that this was increasing the domestic violence in their homes. And above all, they celebrated that they are alive. And perhaps this is not uh, something in Mexico is really suffering. Uh, the feminicide is atrocious, but of course this is a problem for all of us. So in the second gathering, the call for the second gathering in September, 2019, they decided to call to discuss only the um, violence against women. But it is important to stop here for a second and reflect. And sometimes, or many times, actually I just did it several times, we mentioned patriarchy as some important element uh, in the domination and the oppression that the system uh, does. And uh, it is important to, to go deeper into what this means. And in this case, the Zapatistas women explain in this call, sister, compañera, woman in struggle, we are killed and disappeared because we are women and then told it is our fault. You can read it, this online. And definitely they, they decided to treat, um, to use this second gathering to discuss only the violence against women. And there is something very interesting. Uh, I won't take just two more minutes. Uh, in this call, it's like a long letter and they say, uh, what if, compañera and sister, we learn not only to scream out of pain, but to find a way, place, and time to scream a new world into being? Just think, sister, compañera, things are so bad that in order to stay alive, we have to create another world. And this is important because those who struggle, women, men, non-binary, uh, those who write about patriarchy, as I just said, need to find our way to deeply connect with this problem that is life or death. It's important to bear this in mind when we talk about alternatives, and my colleagues will talk more about this, that some people still diminish them as local and irrelevant. This is about creating a world in order to live, if possible, of course, with dignity. So I finish with this. The Zapatistas women and other women are, as we call with our group, women on the verge. We live at the border, as Lugones would say. We are, as Sarah Mota writes, liminal subjects. And being on the verge is a practical thing, not ideological. It's an intuitive position, a feeling, a thing, feeling that means that we have to resist that what we do and what we feel is reduced to the patriarchal language and an alleged rational universal language, for example, of academia and policy. And I hope activism doesn't replicate this. So we struggle beyond what it is possible to say. The Zapatistas women, how open have open spaces of political possibility from where to enunciate new realities. And I think, as Sarah says, Mota, uh, they are weaving their liberation and we are weaving our liberation out of this system. And possibility is to able to speak our own language and to recover the humanity that is denied in patriarchy because it's calling to question really. If we can be cut and in, killed, cut into pieces and put it in a box in Mexico and other cities of the world, tormented and tortured, 
um, is because our humanity is not clear. So I really finish with this and forgive uh, my language, but I will cite Sarah Mota, that for me is an inspiration when she writes in her book on page four is the book is called Liminal Subjects. I make no apology that this does not resemble the text of high theory, that there is no attempt to mimic, imitate or complete. When the misnaming comes of this as ethnic, folkloric and philosophical, etc., my reply is fuck you. No apologies, I will no longer hide, I will speak in our own terms. No more contorting of our bodies and minds and souls into frames. Well, now it is time to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Cecilia. Um, such an interesting concept of being on the verge that you've introduced me to and how the Zapatista women are articulating that liberation. It's great. Thank you. Okay, so if we could move on to Shrishti's presentation next. Uh, thanks, Shelda. Right. And thanks, Anna, for that powerful uh, uh, comment. Um, I think it sets the tone right. Um, so, well, I will be sharing about, um, about some examples um, from India um, and also from other parts of the world um, where women are creating and building and recreating new political horizons. Um, and so I will share a short presentation. Hope you can see it. Um, and the very first example, I would like to straight jump into some of these processes um, and a very inspiring process of women federation and uh, women's fight against injustice is the one that I want to share from central India, uh, where the community and the indigenous peoples have been fighting against um, an extractive mining project in their sacred territories. Uh, while that fight for uh, fight for their rights and survival um, is underway, they also felt the need to come together to collectivize, to create autonomous uh, spaces for decision making, um, to reclaim uh, their rights and uh, control over their uh, means of uh, production. While all of that was happening uh, within the communities, women uh, women collectivized um, because uh, for them. Uh, what was important was that we are fighting against an unjust system. We are fighting against um, the, the state that is repressive. But uh, along with that, it is also to fight against the internal patriarchy um, uh, that has always um, uh, limited women's participation, women's role, women's vision in, in all of these spaces. And uh, they started collectivizing and came together to form a federation um, which, which is not just about being at the forefront of the resistance movement, but also being part of actively part of the traditional decision making systems, taking active control over uh, over their own lives, over the decision making around forests, which is which is how their lives are so interconnected, and uh, building new horizons of uh, of what it is for women to imagine struggles to women to imagine decision making spaces and women to imagine collective spaces and so um, a very powerful example of the autonomy collectivization and women's resistance uh, with the state and also uh, within their own communities the other example uh, this is from the northern part of india um, a very similar example of women fighting against uh, alcoholism, domestic violence, um, which, was, uh, which was so rampant in the community. So a process that began with the struggle against internal patriarchy um, actually emerged into a uh, into lot more things like reclaiming their rights over commons, women realizing that um, it is not just about uh, resistance against patriarchy, but is also about how do we come together, uh, collectivize, um, how do we create our own autonomous spaces, um, also gain um, independence financially, um, and reconnect uh, to the land in a way that um, it is about fostering spaces to um, to come together, which is which it always does, 
but it also creates financial independence. So collective, Marty uh, is a Hindi word to earth. Uh, so collective that is uh, that brings women together, create their autonomous uh, space for decision making, but a very local uh, uh, generation of local livelihoods. So reconnecting with their old crafts, women becoming um, nature guides, knowing about the birds and the biodiversity around them, and also becoming um, uh, creating these homestays, eco-based homestays for people outside. So reconnecting with their cultures, with their traditions, and also uh, people coming from outside, creating that space for them also to reconnect. The third example is from South of India. Again, a very, very ins uh, inspiring example that has been there for three decades. Um, why this example is uh, ex inspiring is because uh, it is about uh, multiple levels of discrimination that these women were able to overcome. These women were Dalit of women farmers. Dalit is a caste in India, which is uh, which is untouchables, basically. Um, women who were landless were able to secure their land rights, um, were not just able to secure land rights, but were able to revive their traditional agricultural practices, um, create um, women's collectives to do all of this work, to conserve, um, to uh, bring back the diversity in agriculture practices, create community grain banks. And through all of that, not just create food security, but also create food sovereignty. That in times of crisis like COVID, they were not able, they were not able to just feed themselves, but, for, but to also people who were coming from outside, um, migrants who were coming back from the city, give them the nutritious food. Um, so, so just creating that um, sense of pride in being a woman, being a farmer, and being able to create that uh, powerful spaces of um, of of um, of also uh, getting into filmmaking, of also doing radio shows, and also creating new ways of learning and doing things. There's another example that I want to share from the West of India, which is also inspiring because this is an attempt made in the city, um, a process that began um, to create space for right for sustainable city and also to uh, democratize city uh, planning and decision making, uh, emerged as also femi feminizing uh, city planning because much of it was actually uh, from a very masculine perspective of what the city should look like, what we need to do first. Um, and women started claiming um, that, that city planning has to become, uh, has to have very uh, integrally, what, is, what, is, what are the visions of women? How do women imagine spaces? So with all of the work on self-reliance in water, solid waste management, or recombining of spaces or creating dignified livelihoods for the poor in the city and the marginalized, women also started creating, uh, bringing in the visions of what it would make a city safer for women. Um, uh, also, what it would make, uh, what it would, uh, what it would look like for especially women who are doing different sort of work. How to, uh, how to respect um, sex work and and different angles of women's work, which doesn't really come into the city planning. And how does one renew that uh, sense of connection? Um, and so, uh, a very interesting process of um, of 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 women being. Uh, actively part of the city planning, democratizing it and bringing in their visions um, at the forefront. The other example is from the uh, from the continent of Africa, a women, women network which emerged as a network to fight against extractive mining projects, um, but is also now uh, um, building in a whole uh, vision of what it is to have just and sustainable futures, working with peasant and working class women in Africa, um, with with very uh, intentional sense of uh, which is the right to say nothing about us without us and women uh, being part of all the decision making of what happens in their territories. And they've collectively defined what they call as Mungele Declaration, living the future now with 26 principles of another world, which is creating the possibilities of the world, which Anas uh, also was saying, a woman network is also uh, the GTA endorsers and you can read about them um, at that link that is mentioned. 
Um, the other example that I want to uh, share is from the uh, Mexico um, and had the uh, really uh, fortunate experience to visit them. Um, it's about uh, University of the Earth started uh, um, and emerged as a resistance um, against the mainstream schooling system um, and creating autonomous learning spaces for the indigenous people there. Um, really rooting themselves in the philosophy of learning by doing. Uh, inspired by this uh, process in the in the Oaxaca city, uh, what these women in the village nearby Oaxaca, Witzo, started this space. Um, uh, uh, 13 women of this village came together and started this space uh, with the same intention of creating um, an autonomous learning space for the young people in their village, um, recreating and reconnecting uh, uh, with the uh, with with the with the earth, uh, coming up with um, new methods and learning new methods of uh, doing eco-based techniques, um, dry toilets, uh, organic agriculture. Uh, reviving their traditional healing practices. But with all of that, reasserting women's space of collectivizing autonomously, um, of coming together, cooking together, um, rejoicing and enjoying the life together, which is, I think, is the most beautiful part of, of these women collectives coming together. The other example, and um, the last one, is I want to share, which is, I guess, very, very inspiring for many of us across the world is um, is the example from Kurdistan. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to visit, but have missed some very inspiring people uh, from there. Um, one of the most difficult regions uh, in the world where women have actually, uh, uh, with, with this narration of autonomy and direct democracy is a is, is, very, is very central to their struggle. But I think what is most amazing to their struggle is the connection with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, with the women's knowledge. And what they've come up with is with called genealogy, which is gen means woman, logy means women's knowledge, which is their response to the, uh, to the modern, um, modernistic knowledge systems, which uh, sort of uh, discredit uh, women's knowledge, which discredit the knowledge of the local. So emerging from that is, is this movement of Kurdish uh, Rajava women's movement, um, which is rooting itself in eco-feminist principles. And this is something that I want to share at the last because it is very, um, very closely connected to what Zapatista says. And Besmi Koncha is a Kurdish activist and a politician who is right now in exile in Germany. And she uh, says that the Kurdish women movement and the liberation movement is so important is because it is rooted in democratic and ecological principles, but what it is centrally trying to narrate is that there are other ways of living, doing, and being than what capitalist modernity tells us. And that is the assertion um, of, of so many of these struggles and so many of these movements of narrating really different ways of being and living, and especially because women are in many of these are so uh, crucially taking the, uh, taking the uh, building those horizons forward. The last is just the key lessons that uh, some of these lessons that are of course evolving, but also emerging from these um, examples. One is of direct radical democracy where women are asserting the space for decision-making uh, and they being centrally involved in that. Um, it is also about localized uh, livelihoods, economic independence for them, and also narrating a, a very different side of uh, economy, which is economy of care, or care for the people, care for the um, uh, for the rest of nature as well, uh, and uh, rooting themselves in their connections with the rest of nature. How does one reestablish their um, relationship and rejuvenate that relationship, or protect that relationship that is being repressed? And one thing that is very crucial is that they are they're narrating women's knowledge. All of these movements have very crucially what is what is to hold women's knowledge together and introducing new forms of learning, knowing and being and doing things. And I think that makes it so much more powerful um, and so much more inspiring. So I will um, so I will uh, take a pause now and back to you, Shelda. Okay, thank you, Shrishti. Some great examples there of, of um, women leading resistances and struggles. So thank you so much. Um, next, I think we have Arturo up right next. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Shelda. My GTA 
fellow panelists for the presentations. And what I'd like to do, I'm going to talk about three things briefly. Uh, the first one is about Zapatismo as a new conversation and a new mode about social struggle and social transformation. The second one is about the concept, metaphor, reality of the caracol, the snail, as the principle for political and territorial autonomy of the Zapatista, very briefly. And the third one is some remarks about feminism and Zapatismo that I think will complement what Anna and Shristi already said so very well. So, and this is going to be maybe a personal introduction about having been myself, but not only myself, obviously, very inspired by the Zapatista since the early 90s when they first erupted into the global scene uh, with the insurrection. So for many of us, the Zapatista uh, have been an amazing inspiration. We have been following Zapatismo and learning from them in very many different ways and about amazed at their remarkable creativity. And I say this, especially for the younger people in the audience who might not have obviously didn't follow Zapatismo when it was happening. They were very inspirational, for instance, in Europe in all the alter globalization movements of the late 90s and early 2000s. And I would encourage you all to go back to that period and read uh, what the Zapatista were writing and producing at that point in time for inspiration. They really were a breath of fresh air. They are weavers par excellence. And the title of this session is Weaving a World Where Many Worlds Fit. Um, so, and um, in hindsight, we can say that what the Zapatismo started was a new conversation and was in a conversation they, they created really a different mood, a new mood for mobilizing, mobilizing against neoliberalism, mobilizing for hope, as Ana Cecilia so well put it, with the global politics of hope. And, um, and going beyond that, obviously, there is a Batista critique of capitalism, neoliberalism, patriarchy, and so forth is hugely important and hugely creative and new. At the same time, it seems to be that uh, it was enriched with this idea that we have to go beyond the current world as we know it. This idea that the world is one, a globalized capitalist world, a global village, and that we have to aim for a transition from that one world or a world that is made only of one world, again, along the lines of the Western historical experience towards a world where many worlds fit. And that insight of uh, that we now call the pluriverse um, has become so important uh, because it has made us aware that what is going on in the world today it's not only an occupation, a political, economic, and sometimes military occupation by neoliberal global capitalism and patriarchy and so forth, but that is also an ontological occupation. It is an occupation by a particular way of being, by a particular model of existence that is occupying and displacing all other possible ways of, ways of being in the world, all other possible ways of constructing the world. And hence what the Zapatista did with that seemingly simple declaration that we want a world where many worlds fit was to, in a way, liberate again that space for the creation of different ways of being in the world and different, yeah, and different. We have to remember that at that point in time, uh, the, the mood was that there was famously articulated by Margaret Thatcher and then by Ronald Reagan, um, and so when the Zapatista came into scene, this was an amazing uh, realization that it didn't have to be that way. Um, so they created an entirely new grammar uh, for talking about these things, embedded also in many different actions that they carried out from 1994, uh, La Sexta Declaración of the Lacandon Rich Forest, the March of the Color of the Earth, 
the revolutionary women's laws that Ana Cecilia already mentioned, uh, the Escuelita Zapatista and the wonderful intervention uh, over the past few years, and many, many more, the intergalactic encuentros. It was, it was an amazing creativity, and I don't think there has been a social movement that has been so creative uh, uh, in, the in the contemporary period as the Zapatista had been. Okay, so the second about the caracol, maybe one, one final thing before, let me check the time. Yeah, before I move to the second point about the caracoles, which is that the notion of the pluriverse has become very, very important today. And I don't think uh, the work of the GTA uh, would have been possible without so much of that inspiration from Zapatismo, particularly in the notion of the pluriverse. It became the organizing principle for a book, collected volume, in which Ashis and I, among the people here present, were involved, that we titled Pluriverse, a post-development dictionary, in which we try to convey our understanding of what is going on through many different entries. There's about 80 some or so entries that present alternative ways of conceiving the world or constructing the world that are going on today. So the pluriverse, we say, is alive and we need to foster and nourish that pluriverse. Okay. Um, so my second point is about the caracol, which is in Spanish, in English, it means snail. You know, the little animal with the, with the shell. Uh, wonderful being, wonderful creature. And maybe I'm going to share my, can I share my screen, I guess? It's okay. So I'll explain this image from Zapatista Arch, but you can start looking at it while I read. I'm going to read something from a wonderful paper by Gustavo Esteva from 2005, which is called Celebration of Zapatismo. And it goes as follows. It says why, he's trying to explain why the Zapatista chose the caracol as the principle of organizing politically and territorially. And it says, the wise ones of olden times say that the hearts of men and women are in the shape of a caracol and that those who have good in their hearts and thoughts walk from one place to, an, to another, awakening gods and people for them to check that the world remains right, that the world remains right. So there's an ethical statement that comes from an ancient tradition. Uh, and then they continued to say the following. They said here that the most ancient ones said that others before them said that the very first people of these lands held an appreciation for the symbol of the caracol. They say that they say that they said that the caracol represents entering, entering into the heart that this is what the very first ones call knowledge. So let me pause here for a moment to make a comment. So the knowledge comes from the heart. And this is very important. Zapatism has become like a commonplace in Latin American epistemology and feminist epistemologies, the idea of sentipensar, that thinking and knowledge is not a question of the mind. It's not just a question of, of the intellect. It's a question of, it's an embodied question. It's a question of the heart as well. And then they, so from there comes the concept of sentipensar or corazonar, also from Chapas, core reasoning, and so forth. And they, they, they go on to say, and also they say that they said that they said that the caracol was a gift for the ear to hear even the most distant words. This they say that they say that they said. The caracoles will be like doors to enter into the communities and for the communities to come out. So my final comment about this is, is that the caracoles is not a symbol of isolation. Autonomy is not about isolating yourself from the rest of the world. It's not autarky. Uh, it's about building the strength and autonomy from within to be able to then share in a struggle and in just the joy of sharing with the rest of the world uh, your way of being uh, without trying to impose it. So in this image, 
okay, in this image, what I see is so, such a fantastic image. There is a lot of Zapatista art. I mean, lots and lots you'll find on the internet. What I find is that you might not be able to see it clearly, but what is sort of the, the image of death that is impacting the caracol is Monsanto, it says Monsanto and Sabritas, which is a uh, artificial sweetener and transgenic seeds and glyphosate and all these different things. So this is sort of the project of death of neoliberal globalization that is impacting the, the Zapatista world, Zapatista communities and communities all over the world. You know, as Shristi show with the examples of South Asia in particular, uh, that that the, the, the caracoles, the autonomous communities attempt to build a world for themselves to protect that world in the context of this global uh, machine that is neoliberal capitalism. And that they maintain their communally oriented walls, uh, their collected walls and collected ways of working in spite of that. Um, so what we have here is that the caracol is also what a good friend Marisol de la Cadena calls a pluriversal contact zone. It's a, it's a zone, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interface. The caracol is an interface between the communities on the ground on the one hand and what comes from the exter exterior, which oftentimes takes the form of something that is imposed upon them, like in this case, represented by Monsanto. Okay, so I wanted to mention that uh, because it's something that many people don't know about any longer. And my last point, which I'd really like to talk about is about the, the relation between feminism and Zapatism. And this is going to be quite brief as well. And I think Ana Cecilia already talked about it and Shristi also uh, um, in really excellent ways. So there are many ways in which we can enter into that question. What is the relationship between Zapatismo and feminism and feminism? And obviously we can start the deeds and thoughts of Zapatista women themselves as a point of departure, and the, law, the revolutionary women's laws. Um, and everything that they are doing on the ground in, in the Zapatista communities to, to end with all forms of hierarchy, particularly patriarchal forms of hierarchy. So this is, all, this is a struggle that is going on in Zapatista communities themselves and is going on all, all over the world. The Rojava feminist struggle that Shristi talked about is tremendously inspirational in that sense. And it's another uh, way in which we can begin to think about the relationship between Zapatismo and autonomous movements. Also, being mindful of the intensification of patriarchy and patriarchal barbarism. I think Ana Cecilia also used that word, uh, uh, which we are seeing in today. And it's not only about the Trumps and the Bolsonaros and the, all the really awful patriarchs uh, that are wreaking havoc on the planet. Uh, in, it's not only, it's definitely about feminicides and femicides that are going on, the intensification of that in the context of the pandemic and the pandemia. Um, but it's also about how we are privileging this world of high technology, which is, as I call it, a techno patriarchal imagination of mastering control over the earth through all kinds of new technologies and so forth. So all of that is in the imaginary. But in the context of Latin American feminisms, which is one of the most important intellectual and political forces in Latin America today, I would say, I would quote what they emphasize always that there is no decolonization without depatriarchalization and deracialization, that the revolution will be a feminist one, an anti racist one, or it won't be. And that's completely clear today for Latin American feminists and including for. Latin American peoples uh, worldwide. So one way in which, and I think my time is up, so I'll just finish with this, is to talk about uh, what a number of Latin American feminists uh, call a politics in the feminine. And the politics in the feminine is a, is a, is a feminist and anti-capitalist politics that is centered on care, that is centered on the production and reproduction of life in autonomy that privileges the healing of the web of life and, and that reconstruct the web of life in place, in community, 
And I think that's an inspiration that we find in both Zapatismo and feminism. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arturo. That was that was beautiful. A beautiful reading from um, Esther as well, which I think somebody put a the title to in the chat because um, there was a couple of questions. Okay, so our final speaker is Ashish Katari. You want to take over? Thank you, Shelda. Thank you, uh, Anthony. And thanks to my colleagues from the GTA core team for laying not just the ground, but lots of the, uh, the, the wonderful infrastructure of the kind of uh, narratives that we're trying to weave together around the world. Um, I should remember next time that I, I must go before Arturo because going after Arturo is always an anticlimax. It's very difficult to match his eloquence. Uh, and so one thing I'm going to do is to resort to slides. Um, and I will uh, speak uh, a little bit about the context of the global tapestry of alternatives and uh, a little bit about what we're trying to do. And to some extent, uh, Shelda has helped with already introducing the GTA. Uh, briefly. I think it's uh, always, this is something that everybody on this call knows very well, but it's always worth reminding ourselves what we are up against. Uh, all the structures that people have been mentioning of patriarchy and racism and capitalism and statism and so on, and especially the form in which they are taking all across the world, um, which is the seductive notion of development. But as we have seen across the entire world, this, this notion and what comes with it um, is a form of violence. There's many different forms of violence against the rest of nature, as you see in that advertisement. Uh, it's violence against communities, especially those communities who are most dependent on nature and natural resources on land, on forests, on waters, etc., and cultures, uh, the homogenization of cultures, and of course, also violence against each one of us individually in terms of our psychological, emotional, cultural well-being. And what we've seen during the COVID pandemic in the last one and a half year, when you know, the whole world has been shaken to its core, is that uh, the system, the entrenched system is essentially, instead of trying to, or instead of realizing that it needs to change, is trying to entrench itself even further, with many of the nation states becoming more authoritarian, many of the biggest corporations in the world uh, becoming more profit seeking and so on. But we've also seen counter trends, which is what uh, I think the GTA is trying to build on, which is expressions of and actions of solidarity. Young people going out of their way to help the elderly, uh, people setting up community kitchens, I mean, all kinds of expressions of reaching out to be able to help those who are most in need, whether it's to do with health or food or livelihoods or other things in which, other ways in which people have been impacted during the pandemic. And it's that hopeful um, sign that, that we really need to, to build on. So what the GTA is trying to do is to point to two kinds of what we would think of as alternatives. One is resistance. And all the previous, my colleagues have spoken about that. The Zapatista itself arose out of, uh, out of resistance to, to the imposition of the nation, the Mexican nation state. Uh, and continues to do that. This particular picture is from about 30 years back from Central India of India of the indigenous people in Central India struggling against two uh, mega hydroelectricity projects. And as they were doing that, they were not just articulating the fact that these projects would displace us, destroy our livelihoods, destroy our forests, but also that this river who you, which you think of as a source of megawatts and electricity for us is our mother. And we will not allow our mother to be shackled by our dams. Now, what these resistance movements therefore are doing, whether it's that one there or it's the anti-racism movements right now in, in uh, many parts of the world, including the US, it's the incredible farmers movement in India right now, which has been on the streets for the last seven, eight months. It's the uh, peace movements in Burma, Myanmar against the military. It's the uh, youth climate justice movements it is the movement for grassroots democracy and a, a new constitution in Chile and many, many, many others. What we're seeing is these expressions of a different way of, of being, of knowing, of dreaming and of doing. And then along with that, of course, uh, the incredible examples of constructive alternatives, of creating 
pathway is meeting human needs and aspirations without destroying the earth and without creating the kinds of inequalities that the current system does. Many examples which my colleagues have already given. Um, so one of the things we've been trying to do here in India arising out of this process that Shishti and I are involved with called the Vikup Sangam or the Alternatives Confluences is to see uh, what is the sort of what are the sort of frameworks that are emerging from these uh, amazing grassroots grounded alternatives? Um, and it's not something that we're kind of imposing from above and saying, okay, this is you know this is what it's it's really articulations from below. Many of them uh, expressed in many different ways, including, for instance, what uh, Arturo just read out, or also what Shristi and Anna Cecilia spoke about. But essentially, what we're seeing is transformations, fundamental systemic transformations in five spheres of life. And of course, they're all interconnected. You can't separate them out. There is the argument for moving away from the Western liberal form of democracy, which is about elections and political parties and hostile competition and so on, to moving towards radical grassroots based democracy and, uh, and institutions which are uh, where everybody can participate with, with equality, where everybody has a voice, uh, but also institutions that are not just seeking rights to decision-making, but also the responsibility of uh, taking decisions that are, uh, that, are, that are respectful of all of human beings and also the rest of nature. We're also seeing movements in the economic sphere of, for instance, what Srishti said about the economy of care and share rather than the economy of finance and capital. Um, the economy of self-reliance, people arguing that for our basic needs, we need to have a localized and open localization, which is uh, where we're not dependent on external corporations and, and uh, nation states, exactly what the Zapatista and the Kurdish movements have done on a large scale, on a smaller scale, many, many other groups and movements are also doing that. But we're also producers, workers are the ones who uh, are in control and not capitalists and not the state. So these are also struggles of social justice, uh, gender justice, anti-racism, anti-casteism, and many others. Um, the fourth sphere here, which I think is really, really crucial and somewhat underemphasized by many of us, is that of cultural and knowledge diversity. Again, we see that virtually all the examples that we're looking at of radical alternatives are where people have asserted their knowledge, their cultures, but are also willing to absorb knowledge and cultures from outside, um, not be xenophobic, xenophobic, but actually say that, yeah, there might be weaknesses in ours, we will accept from outside, but we will accept them on our terms and in ways that don't undermine our own autonomy and, and uh, freedom. So cultural diversity, knowledge diversity, and holding all of these in the commons rather than privatized. And finally, of course, uh, doing all of this on the basis of ecological wisdom and resilience, without which we're all dead anyway. So, um, and at the core of this flower of transformation is probably the most important thing that we're learning from these moments, and which the GTA really wants to emphasize, which is, uh, so I'm not gonna go here, I've already done this. Um, one of which is, how do we re-examine our relationship with nature? When I'm saying we, I'm talking about people like me, who are not living the sorts of lifestyles that a lot of indigenous people still are, which are still deeply in, uh, in integrated within the natural ecosystems which we've been part of. But people like me, and probably most of the people on this call, uh, have in some way or the other got separated from this. And of course, Western modernization has told us that human beings are on top of the evolutionary ladder. We are the lords of the universe. We are separate from nature, et cetera. Whereas what indigenous peoples and local communities have always told us is that we are one element of nature, which is the circle that you see on the right hand side. So it's really about changing a lot of fundamental ethics and values. I'm just going to put this slide up and not really go into uh, any detail on any of them because we don't have the time. But it seems to me that what the currently dominant system is telling us about selfishness, you know, when I was in school, I was told. Um, three main things we need to aim for is money, power, and fame. At least one of these three. If you can get all three, fantastic. But actually what these alternative initiatives are telling us is that those are not the goals in life. The goals in life are, of course, satisfaction, happiness, good social relationships, being one with, uh, with others, um, doing things in cooperation and solidarity as part of the commons. 
uh, respecting others just as you might want them to respect us, which includes also the rest of nature and so many other things that we're learning from these moments. So it's really this ethics of life, worldviews that celebrate life, which is what uh, is our focus. And so when, when people ask, okay, but how do you make the macro changes that are needed? Because obviously that's important. Uh, every small example or even large example is not necessarily in its, on its own going to create those larger shifts. And that's where uh, the attempt to try and bring resistance and, and, and reconstruction and construction together, often they're, together, they're in the same movement, but sometimes they're not. So also building in prefigurative or transfigurative uh, uh, strategies, um, always uh, prioritizing and supporting the movements of the marginalized rather than speaking on their behalf. Uh, looking at what are transitions towards the transformation because you can't make this jump to revolution immediately. So what, what forms of transition would enable the revolution rather than disable it? And also always saying that even as we practice, we also envision the future. And again, there's something that uh, the, the Zapatis and the Kurds are telling us. So let me take the last uh, three, four minutes to talk about the GTA itself. The idea uh, began a few years back. Uh, but really got, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it got its early form a couple of years back when, when it was launched. And the idea essentially is that if there are all these incredible movements happening around the world, resistance and alternatives, especially alternatives, uh, how do we create a platform and a process by which they're able to talk to each other, learn from each other, collaborate, create more of a critical mass um, and affect the larger changes that are necessary but also express and have solidarity with each other because every one of these movements is also threatened. The Zapatistas are constantly under threat from the Mexican state. The Kurds are constantly under threat from all the four nation states uh, that surround them, et cetera. So how do you create global solidarities? And that's exactly what uh, Zapatistas are doing right now in touring Europe, for instance, so that these uh, amazing initiatives can, can survive. Um, so those are the objectives, uh, which, which I've already stated. In terms of the process of the GTA, we want to make sure that this is not a hierarchical, it's not an organization, it's not an umbrella under which everybody else fits, it's just a weaving process. And we do that through uh, trying to optimize and maximize uh, communications, supporting each other's struggles and movements, being available, being there online or physical as far as possible. Um, also constructively challenging each other because you know everybody's nobody's perfect and so if we find that there is something that we feel may be lacking then you can you can challenge but do it in a constructive way um, try and build platforms of uh, cross cultural cross geographic uh, which are very challenging uh, communications and uh, in terms of the structure it's as i said it's not an organization uh, we're we're trying to create we have we have uh, requested and got endorsements from about 50 global and regional uh, movements and networks. I'll just put up the list in a minute. And uh, we're trying to create a, a, an assembly of all of these, which can keep informing the, the global tapestry about activities, make sure that it's going in the right direction, et cetera. Um, and it's this you know, attempt at trying to create this kind of a dialogue between all of these that uh, the GTA is trying to provide. So this is the current list of endorsers. I'm sorry, it's a very long list. So obviously now nobody's gonna be able to read this whole thing in a second, but we'll make this away. This is available already on our website. We've had, uh, we were hoping to do a, a series of physical confluences, but obviously that's not been possible in the last year and a half. So we've done very many webinars, about uh, almost 20 webinars in uh, 2020 and we've just started uh, the series of webinars this this year in fact the first one is on the 2nd of july and we'll, i think shristi maybe you can put up the announcement in the chat uh, of uh, small scale fisheries in costa rica so this is an attempt to try and provide a global platform for people to speak about their initiatives to talk about the kinds of practices and visions that they have we also initiated about six months back a dialogue between seven or eight global processes that are again trying to create similar kinds of uh, you know uh, changes and transformations just to make sure that everybody is kind of at least being able to link up with each other avoid duplication and create more synergy um we're starting this process uh, now 
which is a meta mapping of alternative networks and movements and organizations around the world so that people have in one place uh, a sort of a visual um, platform also where they can find out what sorts of things are happening, whether it's with agroecology or alternative worldviews or with resilience or with ecofeminism and different kinds of things. So this is a platform that's beginning. It's going to be an open source platform, which we hope partners and endorsers will be able to use on their own. Much more information available on our website, please do visit. And on behalf of uh, all of my core team members also, I would request people to let us know how they would like to participate. Tell us if there are other networks and organizations that should be part of this uh, very exciting process. With that, uh, I will end. Thanks once again to you all for giving us this opportunity. And we're going to follow very closely the Zapatista tour in Europe. And we hope at some point they can also visit us in South Asia. Thank you, Thank Rashid. You. Can you just join me in giving everyone like a virtual round of applause for the talks today? Thank you so much.